All right, all right. Rad Nation, today we're gonna to be talking about perfusion imaging, general concepts behind perfusion imaging, and some specifics for cerebral imaging of stroke. And we're gonna also get a hands-on demonstration to show you the basic concept of what we're looking at as far as blood going through the tissue in the brain, and then how we can make an image of the actual blood flow. The standard CT image is a map of the attenuation values in the tissue in what we call Hounsfield units. We're typically just displaying that in a black and white value image. So if the patient is suspected of having a stroke, this type of image is actually very good in identifying a stroke which is based on a hemorrhage. So basically when blood is leaking out of an artery, you can see that in the case of this hemorrhage here. And that's very easy to identify because the blood is more attenuating because of the hemoglobin in the blood, it is more attenuating than the soft tissue around it. So identifying a stroke which is based on a hemorrhage is actually relatively well done by CT. And CT, also because of its availability and because it's 24 hours usually, it's gonna be often a number one place to go to for stroke imaging. So hemorrhage accounts for a minority of the cases of stroke. The other case is the ischemic stroke where there's actually a blockage and there's reduced blood flow to the tissue and thus the tissue is either dead or at risk of dying. And what we wanna do is look at an alternative method to standard CT imaging in order to have something that can be more sensitive to the actual tissue characteristics so that we can help identify if there is a significant region in the brain which is at risk of dying but hasn't yet died. Typically, the next thing after that non-contrast CT will be a basic CT angiography exam. That basic CT angiography exam will actually be able to identify large vessel occlusions and if a large vessel is occluded, you will actually see that that branch will stop rather than continuing going in a CT angiography exam. There's also been work as of late that's based on looking at multi-phase CTAs, and we can also have ways to visualize those multi-phase CTAs. If you're interested in that, let me know down in the comments below and we can make a video on that. But Typically you'll have a non-contrast, then you'll have a CTA. And then after the CTA is where we're looking at the CT perfusion. And go over to me and my son, Luca, talking about the basics of arteries, capillaries, and veins. So today we're talking about CT perfusion and just perfusion in general, myocardial perfusion, liver perfusion, neural perfusion. These are all applications that are of interest on your CT scanner. But first off, what's actually going on and how are we gonna measure it on a CT scanner? This is the heart, this is the artery, this is the tissue, and this is the vein. Yeah, so like you said, this is the heart, artery, tissue, and the vein. In reality, a real circulatory system, it would be going back from the vein back into the heart, right? But we don't have anything with that much fanciness here. But Luca, why don't you start to pour it? Okay. So here comes the blood. The blood's coming out of the artery. It's coming into the tissue. And then as it goes through the tissue, it's getting distributed and spreading out over more of the tissue. So it's going a little more slowly through the tissue. You might wonder why is this green anyway? It's so you can see it and you know, as a Michigan State Spartan, I do ble bleed green. So that's the idea here is that again, the blood coming from artery, tissue, and then into vein. Just like in our CT image, we can actually see the arteries and we can see the veins. So in this case, we can see it as it's coming in through the artery and we can see it when it's in the vein, but it's difficult to really see it while it's in that tissue itself. But we can tell that it's spreading out in that tissue and we're gonna use a property when we do it on the CT scanner, we're gonna use a property of the attenuation, namely by adding contrast agent, we're gonna be able to make that blood more attenuating that has that contrast agent in it 
so that when it spreads out into the tissue, even though we can't image the individual tissue and see the individual tissue, we'll be able to see the CT number getting higher. It's subtly higher, but it will be getting higher within the tissue itself. And as we do that over time, we're gonna be able to see how the blood is flowing through the tissue itself. Like we talked about in that example that we showed you, you have the arteries coming in, then the blood is distributed in the capillaries, and then it's coming out in the veins. And this was our analogy here that we wanna visualize our tissue as basically a sponge, wherein the blood is actually gonna be spread out such that we're not gonna be able to visualize the individual capillaries on our CT image, but we can visualize the result of, for instance, if we have iodinated contrast, which is coming in through the artery, and then it's spreading out throughout the capillaries, it is going to raise the CT number in that capillary bed, even though it will be significantly raised less than in the arteries because we're spreading out that contrast, but we will be able to still see a increase in the CT number. So if we take images over time, we'll be able to see that increase in the CT number and figure out some characteristics about how the blood is flowing through the different parts of the tissue. So what does that look like in reality? In reality, it looks something like this, wherein if we put a region of interest in an artery, so we call that an arterial input function, we call that an input because, again, like we talked about, the arteries are the input to the capillary bed that we're interested in looking at. So if we track that region of interest and look at the CT numbers in that region of interest over time, it's gonna look something like this, where it'll go up at some time and then it'll come back down. This out here is actually called a recirculation peak. And it's actually possible if the blood makes it through one pass around the whole circulatory system. Then the idea is to look at what's happening in the tissue. So if you put a region of interest somewhere in the tissue, the idea would be that you could look at a curve and it would be something like this, where it's actually going to be increasing, but the amount that it's increasing is gonna be significantly less than that of the artery case. And we can think about actually what we're gonna do is for every voxel here that's in the image, if it's not an artery or a vein, we're actually gonna treat it like tissue and we're going to make a map of what the blood flow parameters are based on the individual characteristics of the CT number going up and down in each of those given image voxels separately. Then we can also use the venous response sometimes for what we call a normalization in our calculations and we can put an ROI in a vein and then there could be a response that looks something like this. Again, the arteries and veins are gonna have significantly greater contrast compared with the tissue. So again, what does this look like? You have arteries and then capillaries and veins. And in reality, just like I drew, you're gonna be able to measure an arterial input function that looks something like this. And then in the capillaries, you're gonna measure something like this. And the question we have is, Imagine we insert, instead of having this arterial input function that was spread out, imagine if we could put in a perfect, what we call an impulse. So if we put in all of a sudden, we put all of the contrast, we inject it right in the artery, instead of injecting it in the vein and allowing it to go through the whole circulatory system, what if we injected it right locally before that capillary bed? We did a small little injection right there then we would get an impulse for our input because it didn't have time for the actual contrast to spread out during the circulatory system. So if you have a little impulse like this, then we wanna calculate what we call the impulse response function. And this is a fancy word that we call deconvolution, but it's basically trying to figure out what the impulse response function would be. So the same function we would be able to map this arterial function to the capillary function, and then that same exact function, we would map this little impulse function into what we call the impulse response function. The impulse response function actually is gonna look something like this. 
where it starts out high and then it's gonna decrease over time. And the properties of impulse response function are actually gonna be used to calculate the perfusion. The height of that is actually going to give us the cerebral blood flow. And then time is on this axis down here. So if you look at essentially the average time it takes for the blood to get through any given tissue bed, that's gonna be what we call the mean transit time. Then also sometimes you like to talk about the T max, which is looking at a later time for basically all of the blood to get through. And then if you look at the area under this curve, that'll give us what's called the cerebral blood volume. So these are the three basic parameters. And then there's additional parameters which have been added over time. These are the three basic parameters for perfusion imaging. And then the idea is that if you come in, you don't have a hemorrhage and you want to look at the actual tissue, if there is an ischemic event, there can be potentially a core area in the ischemic event, and that is going to be necrotic tissue, which means it's fully dead. So the core is unsalvageable. We cannot rescue it if we go in and do an intervention of any kind. And then what we're looking at is, is there a region beyond the core, which is ischemic? So additional thing to note, is that the tissue and the capillaries are not able to dilate any further in the case that that tissue is necrotic. And in this scenario, the cerebral blood volume is actually gonna be significantly different than the tissue around it. This has been demonstrated in the literature. Here's an example by Max Wintermark and the actual reference values that we can use here are the MRI, MRI with the diffusion weighted image sequence, or it's called DWI, is actually gonna be our ground truth here. And this is demonstrating at the time that the patient is emitted, they had this sequence, and you can see there's a region here, which is the core region. And then if you look at these images, this is the mean transit time, this is the cerebral blood flow and the cerebral blood volume. And they found in the paper that actually the cerebral blood volume correlated the best with the MRI image for the actual infarct. Then outside of that infarct region, there's a penumbra, which is an ischemic region, which means it's an area which has less blood flow than is typical. And so that tissue is actually at risk of dying, but has not died as of yet. So then again, we want to use those perfusion values and try and find a surrogate for the infarct region. And then in the Wintermark paper, if you look at subsequent imaging, you can see the DWI again as the reference that the mean transit time is actually the best correlate with the subsequent DWI. So this is saying, the actual ischemic region is actually gonna be correlating, of these three parameters, it's gonna be correlating best with the mean transit time. You would like to use that information to actually make the decision if there's a relatively large penumbra or a region of tissue which is not yet dead, but is at the risk of dying, that is a positive sign for doing an intervention. If you have relatively small mismatch and a relatively large region of necrotic tissue. That's the case where there's actually not significant tissue to save, so you would not want to do an intervention. There's a number of vendors that have solutions about this. The GE approach is based on the research of Dr. Ting Li, and he demonstrated this as part of his PhD and subsequent research in the field actually using bunnies and using microspheres to demonstrate the perfusion and the CT perfusion matching well that ground truth of microspheres demonstrated in bunnies. And this is available as a 4D product for GE. And there's a number of vendors that have solutions in the perfusion space. And one thing right now is that unfortunately, the different vendors each have different algorithms. So there's not actually a guarantee to get the same results.
from one vendor to another. If you just look at this map, you can get the sense that there is a region right here. But if you try and actually just do a threshold on this map, you may get an exaggeration of a larger region. Whereas if you do a probability function based on what's called regression or fitting, you can get something that says the probability of the infarct is in this region. And that actually can correlate well to, if you look on the non-contrast CT, again, this is at the time that the patient was admitted. Again, this is showing why we actually need perfusion imaging because on the non-contrast CT, you can't visualize this region here. But then if you look at the non-contrast CT from the follow-up exam, you can see that that actually correlates relatively well with these type of probability maps for the infarction. So now you really appreciate the neuroperfusion imaging and definitely the brain is the most important part of the body, but probably a close second would actually be the heart. And since you don't yet fully understand all the intricacies of cardiac CT, you're definitely gonna wanna check out our video on cardiac CT imaging coming up here. I hope you have a good day and bye.